In this video, we will explore objection, which is arguably the driving force behind the horror genre. There will be three parts consisting of, firstly, the fundamentals of the horror genre. This part serves as a brief introduction to the genre as a whole. Secondly, an introduction to objection. The Last of Us and The Walking Dead will serve as primary examples to illustrate the concept. Be prepared for spoilers for both franchises. Thirdly, the abject horrors of having a body. In this last part, we will elaborate on the concept of abjection with the subgenre of body horror which provides lots of room for analysis. Here, we'll make use of the film examples Pan's Labyrinth, The Shining, and The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. If you're only interested in certain parts of the video, you may skip to the according timestamps shown right now. Why are horror movies so scary? And why are they so addictive to watch, even though they thrive in blood, death and violence? Why can't we stop looking when a woman in a movie cycle is brutally murdered in the shower? Why is there a shiver down our spine when watching the claw in it? And what makes a movie alien so scary? To answer these questions, we will explore the object, the driving force behind the horror genre. Before talking about objection, we firstly have to define the horror genre. What are similarities and differences to other genres? To explore this, we will make use of the text Der Horror Film by Peter Podras. Podras firstly presents a definition by Robin Wood. Normality is threatened by the monster. This quote can be transferred to other genres as well, but gives us the first definition of the genre itself. Furthermore, there are some essential terms when diving into the horror genre. Firstly, there is the uncanny, das Unheimliche, a term which was established by Sigmund Freud. Potras quotes Jens, who explains that there is doubt that a living individual has a soul, and doubt that a lifeless individual has no soul. So, there is an uncertainty and an uneasiness that specifically relates to human-like objects, but also to individuals that are only seemingly human. He names dolls as an example, and I think we can all deeply relate to that. Dolls are eerily creepy. Almost as creepy as people collecting eerily creepy dolls. Personally, I constantly have flashbacks to that ugly porcelain doll that hung on strings above a fireplace in my grandparents' house. One of the most uncanny things I have ever seen. And I was always worried that it would simply start to move. Which coincidentally is the plot of many, many horror movies. Freud himself describes the uncanny as a kind of fright, which goes back to the familiar and the already known, and then stop again as return of dead people and ghosts as examples. So we can conclude that something that has been buried, something dark and sinister, returns to haunt the human world. This of course mostly relates to classic supernatural horror. Lastly, horror includes certain common factors and tropes. For example, the monster crosses boundaries. In the classic horror, that monster is seen as an alien, sometimes a literal alien like the alien in the movie Alien, so an alien danger that steps into the human world. For example, in The Mummy, there is a bloodthirsty ghost trying to get back its body or any body parts and is haunting, of course, murdering the people who opened his tomb. Thus, the monster crosses into the world of the humans. On the other hand, in Pasquale horror, the monster is made by society. There is a danger from inside, and not an alien monster, but a killer or a psychopath who is part of society. Unlike a monster in the literal sense, there is now a human monster or a monstrous human. My favorite example is the series Hannibal, in which boundaries of morality are crossed. The serial killer and cannibal Hannibal Lecter is part of high society of Baltimore, is a respected psychiatrist, but still has the time manipulating his patients, cooking, throwing dinner parties, and serving rude people as artistic displays to the FBI, and also serving them as meals to the FBI, of course. Furthermore, there is also a crossing into the human body itself, for example in The Thing. Also, there are certain gender roles which come upon in horror movies. Usually, there is the man as a strong hero and defeating the monster. On the other hand, Podras explains, the woman must be saved and has the role of a victim. Lastly, there is the final girl who defeats the monster in the end. She has a name that's not gender-coded 
and a sexually inactive role. She symbolically castrates the killer with its own weapon, for example, killing them with a chainsaw. The case can be made that there is a common misconception concerning antagonistic entities in the horror genre. In his essay Match Made in Hell, The Inevitable Success of the Horror Genre in Video Games, Richard Rouse III argues, among other things, for a simple story with a purely and unequivocally evil antagonistic force to be ideally suited for horror games. This essay was published in 2009, and it only makes sense that video ludic horror has significantly evolved since then. To illustrate why exactly we regard some of his ideas as outdated, we'll take a look at the wildly successful horror franchise The Last of Us. After that, we'll apply this example to a larger concept in horror, which is objection. This will show how the change-up in storytelling doesn't have negative consequences for the horror aspect. On a surface level, The Last of Us consists of the exact things Rouse talks about. There are, for instance, environmental storytelling and a scarcity of resources, making for easier identification of the player with the protagonist. And above all, there is of course the premise of a zombie apocalypse. Now this should make for a rather simplistic story of just killing evil and mindless monsters without a second thought, right? Well, of course, this is not actually the case. The omnipresent threat of the so-called infected is by far not the only thing Joel and Ellie have got to watch out for. In desperate times, humans will do desperate things like forming violent or even cannibalistic groups as a means to survive. The Last of Us is an example of taking the easy-to-grasp premise of surviving in a post-apocalyptic world and focusing on creating multifaceted storytelling with a bunch of hard-hitting moral dilemmas along the way. As far as the evil in form of the infected is concerned, it is actually quite common for people to feel empathy for the infected if information about their past lives is available to them. This can obviously be achieved through environmental storytelling, but it has the most impact if the player gets to witness their downfall with them. Personally, when Sam and Henry died, that was one of the few times a fictional story has managed to make me cry. This certain kind of empathy puts the aforementioned evil into perspective. The monsters you're supposed to kill in the game aren't actually evil, but something evil is controlling them, meaning the antagonistic force only exists on a rather abstract level. Still, naturally, that doesn't make the infected any less terrifying. You could actually make the argument that it adds to the horror the audience perceives. When looking at someone you know that has turned, there is a perceived inner conflict between what is and what once was. This fits perfectly into the broader concept of objection, as described by Julia Kristeva in her work Powers of Horror. The abject refers to the human reaction to a threatened breakdown in meaning caused by the loss of the distinction between subject and object or between self and other. To put it a bit differently, objection is when a certain dilemma is presented to us. There might be a conflict between the past and the present, which we reject. A response with disgust, nausea, discomfort, unease, fear and horror indicate an inner desire to distance ourselves not just from the medium, but from the experienced objection itself. Kristeva employs numerous examples to get her point across, mostly relating to things like corpses, spoiled food, and sickness. If something exists between life and death, like a zombie, we automatically reject it and don't want to be associated with it, since we belong to the living. It subliminally challenges our perception of what is real, invoking feelings of horror. That's why it's so terrifying to hear Sam reflect on whether there are still human minds left imprisoned in the infected's bodies, unable to change anything about their actions. When he dies shortly thereafter, the audience is left devastated. In addition to this, if we struggle to understand the character's actions, we might call them unjust to make sense of it all. We are repulsed by a moral dilemma and try to distance ourselves from it, which, again, is a form of objection. I'll emphasize this point with a little anecdotal experience of mine playing The Last of Us Part 1. If you know anything about the game, you'll likely be aware that Ellie is immune to the Cordyceps virus. Joel takes her on a journey across the United States in the hopes of making the development of a cure possible, potentially ending the nightmare they're living in. When they finally make it to their destination, Joel is told that Ellie would have to sacrifice her life in order to make the cure possible. Here's arguably where the central, though not only, moral dilemma of the franchise is introduced. He's grown to like Ellie a lot, and might even see his deceased daughter in her. 
So what does he do? He frees her by force, killing a bunch of people in the process, and drives away with Ellie, without her even knowing what just happened. I was personally terrified when I was playing Joel, left with no choice but to kill those people at the hospital to save Ellie. I was incredibly upset because, although his actions were understandable in a way, I still regarded them as selfish. This experience will of course be different from player to player, but it still supports this point pretty well. Part 2 follows up on this and puts even greater emphasis on moral ambiguity as we get to play both sides of two human parties seeking revenge for things that lie in the past. On a related note, The Walking Dead's equally post-apocalyptic setting presents similar opportunities for moral dilemmas. Obviously, there's the recurring question of whether to trust strangers in a world where virtually anyone would do anything to survive. Another more specific example is when the Green family living on the farm in Season 2 locked up walkers in their barn and even fed them because they didn't think of them as undead monsters but merely sick people in dire need of help. The shown empathy for the undead, the unspeakable actions of which the audience has already extensively borne witness to, provokes a strong repulsive reaction which can even be seen on many characters in the show. The emotional reactions upon Walker Sophia's reveal make it all the more hard to bear. Furthermore, when Lizzie killed her sister in season 4, it left the audiences in utter shock. Her motivation was that Micah would come back as Walker anyway, and she saw absolutely nothing wrong with that. At this point, it should be evident how the presented moral dilemma was able to leave many speechless. Liminal spaces is a term for spaces caught between worlds, in between meanings, so to say. You might get an eerie feeling when a subway station is used for something other than traveling. If the established meaning or function of a place has broken down, that is, once again, inherently abject and evokes according feelings of unease. The idea of liminal spaces can be transferred to many physical locations in a post-apocalyptic context, specifically in urban settings. There are many places that, due to the collapse of civilization, don't work like they used to. An interesting aspect of objection is that the horrifying effect seems to take many different forms, regardless of whether the alienation is expanded upon or vice versa. In The Last of Us, the infected have got fungus growing all over their body, making for an increased physical alteration of the subjects over time. We as an audience often sense a feeling of disgust from looking at higher stages of the infection, since we are repulsed by the physical traits relating to sickness, presenting potential immediate danger to us. In doing so, we not only position ourselves in the living world, but also the world of the healthy. In The Last of Us, the infected aren't technically dead. Their heart is still beating and they need their essential organs to survive, unlike the walkers in The Walking Dead, which can only be killed by destroying the brain. Still, through combining the objection of the zombie-like creatures, commonly known as walking corpses, with the element of sickness, the objection might have an even more potent impact than with traditional zombies. Moreover, the progression of the cordyceps infection can be categorized into stages depending on how much of the brain the fungus has managed to reach since the initial infection. Stage 1 consists of the simple-minded runners doing exactly as their name suggests. They act purely on instinct. Interestingly, while all infected share the same goal of infecting any healthy humans they can find, the stage 2 progression of the stalkers takes a more refined and tactical hunting approach. They like to lurk in corners and unexpectedly ambush you from behind, adding the element of suspense, potentially creeping out the players as this tactical approach cannot be observed from any other stages of the infection. Thus, stage 2 provides further alienation through more visible fungus, for instance, but also uniquely introduces the typically human and familiar trait of strategic planning, at least on a smaller scale. So with the stalkers, the effective objection can be felt in two ways which mesh very well together. From stage 3 on, the infected pretty much gains superhuman strength, but lose their ability to see, meaning they have to rely on a version of echolocation. The tactical wit from the stalker stage seems to have regressed as well. This allows for the iconic and creepy clickers to exist, along with these two big boys, the shamblers and the bloaters. While the alienation in these stages should be pretty evident, the special threat to human life in these cases makes for an even greater frightening effect. This abomination right here is called the Rat King, and honestly, do I need to explain myself any further?
As we have already discovered in the previous part, the concept of the abject aims to explain why we are fascinated by horror. But there is one particular subgenre that can evoke abjection most effectively – body horror. The genre emerged in the 70s where new horror elements were added to already familiar tropes. This means destruction, deformation, mutation of the human body and uncontrolled leakage of bodily fluids. Body horror is meant to be disgusting and uncomfortable. In particular, it offers an experience of the abject that is specific to the human body, as it deals with death, decay, loss of identity and social taboos. The human body is disfigured through deformation or mutation, but remains recognizable as such to a certain extent, therefore representing the abject. Accordingly, one can conclude that the abject is a central theme in body horror and a reason for the fascination with the genre. Body horror is a way of perceiving the abject and yet separating ourselves from it as subjects. In the following, I will analyze scenes from three movies that are well known for the body horror in order to further explain the link between horror and abjection. So, let's talk about Pan's Labyrinth. Pan's Labyrinth is a dark fantasy movie from 2006, directed by Guillermo del Toro and set in Spain in 1944. The story follows young Ophelia who moves in with her sadistic, facious stepfather, Capitan Vidal. Exploring a mysterious labyrinth, Ophelia encounters Pan, a fawn who reveals her destiny as the reincarnation of a princess. To prove her worth, Ophelia undertakes three challenging tasks. Meanwhile, Vidal ruthlessly suppresses a rebellion in the forest. Regarding body horror elements in Pan's Labyrinth, there's a striking and iconic scene featuring the so-called Pale Man. In the Pale Man scene, Ophelia, guided by three fairies, enters a dark and mysterious room. In the center sits the Pale Man, a grotesque creature with eyes in the palms of its hands. The Pale Man is surrounded by a feast of tempting food that Ophelia must not eat. It then, seemingly dormant, awakens when Ophelia disobeys and eats some grapes. The creature then devours two of the fairies and starts chasing Ophelia. The most striking element of body horror are the eyes and the palms of the pale man's hands. This deformity challenges the normal human anatomy. As it puts its hands in front of its face, it becomes an unsettling moment, blurring the lines between bodily functions and monstrous transformation. The tension is then heightened as it extends the palms of its hands, eyes wide open, symbolizing the threat of bodily harm and capturing the essence of body horror. Combining these elements with the theoretic framework of Kristeva, it becomes clear that the pale man symbolizes the abject. The act is both repulsive and fascinating, invoking a sense of horror associated with bodily boundaries being violated. The Forbidden Feast also contributes to the objection by creating a blend of the alluring and the horrifying. Lastly, the painted on door that Ophelia draws in order to return to the real world represents the liminal spaces discussed in Christopher's work. It serves as a portal between the two worlds and thus creates a connection between the imagined and the genuine. In essence, the pale man scene encapsulates objection through its use of deformity, forbidden consumption and the monstrous pursuit of the protagonist. The Shining, directed by Stanley Kubrick in 1980, follows the Torrance family as they become the winter caretakers of the remote Overlook Hotel. Jack Torrance, a struggling writer and recovering alcoholic, moves in with his wife Wendy and their young son Danny. As the family becomes isolated in the vast, empty hotel, Jack's mental stability deteriorates, influenced by the supernatural forces within. The film is a psychological horror movie, exploring themes of isolation, family dynamics and the supernatural. The scene most striking in terms of body horror is Room 237. In this scene, Jack enters the room and discovers a mysterious, naked and attractive woman in the bathtub. He goes up to her and starts to kiss and touch her, but the encounter takes a disturbing turn as the beautiful woman transforms into a decaying, ghostly figure. Jack, shocked with fear, tumbles backwards out of the room and flees from the old woman, who lurches after him, laughing hysterically. The body horror is accentuated by the depiction of decay and distortion of the human form. This transformation challenges the viewer's perception of the human body as the beautiful turns grotesque. The abrupt and unnatural changes in the woman's physicality contribute to a sense of dread and discomfort. Furthermore, the body horror elements in this scene are deeply psychological. Jack's fascination with the woman's beauty transforms into horror. This transformation from beauty to decay taps into themes of the uncanny, where something that should be familiar becomes unsettling and eerie. So, the abject nature of the scene lies in the disruption of beauty and decay, life and death. The abrupt shift from desire to repulsion challenges the viewer's sense of identity and familiarity, as the once attractive woman becomes a source of abject horror. As Kristeva states, the abject describes what disturbs identity, system, order, what does not respect borders, positions, rules. 
Now the Overlook Hotel is symmetrically precise. The arrangement of each scene is planned. However, this order is repeatedly disrupted by the abject, in this case the decaying old corpse. On close inspection of the various locations in the hotel, it has become apparent time and again that the Overlook Hotel, in fact, makes no spatial sense. Places change location, doors and corridors lead to different rooms, the seemingly perfect setting proves to be misleading and chaotic. The logical order of the world is shattered and the events slip more and more into the surreal and abject. Going on, the scene can also be linked to the theory of the monstrous feminine, a concept often explored in feminist film theory. Proposed by Barbara Creed, it is examined how women are portrayed in horror films, often depicting them as monstrous or threatening and associated with abjection. They are sometimes portrayed as embodying the ambiguous and frightening aspects of the unknown. Transformations, deformities and physical alterations are used to evoke fear and women are portrayed as embodying these monstrous qualities. Furthermore, the monster feminine theory often explores the link between female sexuality and horror. Female characters who express their sexuality or deviate from societal norms may be portrayed as monstrous, reflecting cultural anxieties surrounding women's sexuality. Now applying this concept to the woman in room 237, it becomes clear that the transformation aligns with the theory's ambiguity and the blurring of the boundaries. The initial seductive appearance of the woman followed by a horrifying transformation reflects the links between female sexuality and horror. It plays into the cultural trope of the femme fatale who, when her sexuality is embraced, becomes a source of terror. The transformation of the woman embodies the monstrous feminine, challenging societal expectations and generating horror. Besides that, I just shortly want to mention the probably most important theme of The Shining and how it is linked to objection. It's isolation. As the characters become increasingly isolated, their perceptions of reality are distorted and the boundaries between the self and the other, the unfamiliar and familiar, begin to blur, therefore further enhancing the abject within the movie. The wide angle shots and huge rooms within the hotel underline the size of the Overlook Hotel and how, in contrast, empty and isolated the Torrance's feel. Without external connections and social reinforcement, the boundaries between the self and the abject become uncertain. The hotel becomes a space of psychological horror where the intense feelings of isolation contribute to the abject elements in the narrative. Abjection flourishes in isolation. Also, there's another not-so-fictional point that has had a huge impact on the abject nature of the movie. Kubrick seemed to have problems with Shelley Duvall, who played Wendy. In interviews, she later describes the bad conditions of the shooting, how she was harassed by Kubrick and sometimes slipped into real, not-acted fear due to the immense pressure and stress. The staircase scene, for instance, is often described as the most repeatedly shot scene, which led to real panic, hyperventilation and dehydration of Duvall. Furthermore, Kubrick intentionally isolated Duval from the rest of the cast and crew. This was done to enhance her sense of isolation, which is reflected in Wendy's character. However, the real-life isolation contributed to Duval feeling alone and vulnerable during the production. Reportedly, the stress and emotional toll of Duval reached a point during the filming process where she got sick for months on end and even led to her hair falling out. How this relates to the abject will become evident when talking about our next film example. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, directed by Toby Hooper in 1974, follows a group of friends traveling through rural Texas who encounter a family of cannibals, called the Sawyers. They stumble upon Leatherface, a chainsaw killer, and are one by one captured, tortured and killed. Sally Hardesty becomes the sole survivor enduring a nightmarish ordeal. The film explores themes of rural horror, isolation and the brutality of human nature. The movie was produced with a low budget, which is why most scenes were filmed for long hours, seven days a week. Allegedly, the infamous dinner scene, which we will come to talk about in a few seconds, took over 20 hours to finish, meaning the sweat, tears and stress of the actors were in fact real. Gunnar Hansen, who plays Leatherface, was method acting throughout the production, meaning he barely spoke to the other cast members. Furthermore, Hooper tried to keep the set of the film as realistic as possible, filming in an actual house and fields in Texas as to avoid studio costs and not using props but real animal carcasses and bones, adding an authentic feeling of disgust and dread to the set and of course a certain smell that cannot even be conveyed through the movie. Also, during the dinner scene, Sally's finger is cut with a real knife because they ran out of fake blood. So like in The Shining, the boundaries between the fictional world and the filming process are crossed. It is not recognizable which fear and disgust are acted and which were real. 
This, again, allows the liminal space and the abject to emerge. The dinner scene is the most disturbing and best known moment of the movie. Sally finds herself trapped in the home of the Sawyers during a chaotic dinner where Leatherface, the hitchhiker, the cook and the corpse-like grandfather torment their victims. Obviously, the act of cannibalism is a significant body horror element, directly involving the human body in a taboo manner. The grandfather's physical state also adds to the body horror with his near-mummified appearance challenging conventional ideas of the human body. The distorted faces and expressions of the Sawyer family members and the erratic movements, especially leather faces, amplify the horror and discomfort and create a sense of bodily abnormality. The use of animal bones, feathers and human remains blurs the boundaries between human and animal. Violent actions, such as hitting Sally and grabbing her face, involve a direct physical confrontation and a violation of the human form. The dinner scene therefore encapsulates objection through the series of body horror elements that deliberately transgress societal norms. Cannibalistic imagery takes center stage, but so do the distorted and dysfunctional dynamics within the family, particularly exhibited by Leatherface and the Hitchhiker, reinforcing the abject nature of the scene. Animal elements further challenge viewers' notions of acceptability and familiarity. The sensory overload, marked by loud noises, grotesque visuals, the jump cut editing and chaotic movements, adds to the objection by creating a disorienting and unsettling experience that violates the viewer's sense of order and normalcy. The deteriorated physical state of characters, notably the grandfathers, adds another layer to the objection. Additionally, the iconic concept of Leatherface wearing a mask made from human skin aligns perfectly with Kristeva's idea of objection, as it blurs the boundaries between the human and the inhuman and upsets the meaning of the sense of self. A little easter egg on the side. The significance of the scene as an iconic moment in the film can also be seen from the fact that it repeatedly appears in other media. In Resident Evil 7, for example, a very similar scene is visualized. As in the film, the player wakes up from a faint, sitting tied to a table, and finds himself at a dinner with a family eating rotten carcasses. Now I shortly want to talk about the ending scene of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre that is crucial to the film's impact. The final sequence shows Sally narrowly escaping Leatherface and his chainsaw. The film concludes with Sally's uncontrollable laughter as she rides away in the back of a passing truck, covered in blood and visibly traumatized. The significance lies in the portrayal of a psychological breakdown underlining the film's exploration of psychological horror. This scene, again, is primarily about the abject. Her distressed appearance challenges the conventional portrayal of the final girl in horror films. Sally's traumatized state emphasizes the psychological toll and disrupts the boundaries between the intact and the violated self. However, she is covered in blood, laughing hysterically, is dangerously injured and weak, but Nonetheless, she is still alive. The ending scene underlines the true meaning and impact of the abject and its strong psychological foundations. Sally is the personification of the will to survive that underlies the abject, the turning away from the disturbing and grotesque, the identification of oneself as a living subject. Sally escapes the other face, the violence, the madness, the terror, she escapes death, and with it, the horror of the abject. Personally, I always thought that the ending was really ecstatic that even though Sally has faced unimaginable violence, terror and fright, she still managed to escape, to stay alive. To me, the essence of objection comes down to exactly this, to distinguish oneself from the unfamiliar, the uncanny, from the violent and the dead. The reason why the horror genre works and why objection is such a fascinating concept to me is because they rely on our most intuitive survival skills and our strong will to live. In my opinion, Sally is the embodiment of this re-establishment of one's own identity in contrast to the dangers of objection. It is a testimony of resilience and survival.